Well, we are now officially at the halfway part of the season, but unfortunately, as I did a couple of weeks ago when it was like the quarter mark of the season where I did a kind of reviewing how each team in MLS is doing via the power rankings, unfortunately that video is probably going to be delayed for the halfway point because we are right now in probably the busiest time in terms of me producing video on my channel because I have to talk about the World Cup and then I have to, to talk about MLS and this is actually my third video that I'm making today and I'll probably make another video after this because I have to preview the midweek games and the 4th of July game that is going to be happening this week. So that is a lot of video that I have to do and I'm definitely starting to feel the the fatigue level of this and the fact that I felt like right now with the way I'm just uploading so much so many video on my channel I'm starting to see people are not watching some of my videos and I think the reason why that is the case is because since I'm uploading so many video on my channel you know I'm pretty sure unless you are a really die hard and loyal supporter of my channel which I hope you are you're not gonna be spending every day to just watch like f four videos every single day on my channel or two video every single day on my channel it is incredibly hard to do and I bet you probably won't even be staying tuned to the end of the video because you know you might be just tuning in the first couple of part and then you have to watch my other video which is also the reason why I'm trying to keep these videos short like I'm trying to I'm sorry to feel like some of my videos are just way too long especially my MLS review video which is always the longest besides the preview uh, but you know unfortunately I have to do this because I I am covering the World Cup and you know the other thing I could do is just move the World Cup kind of content into my second channel but you know my second channel has been pretty dead lately and you know as much as I want to to kind of get my second channel back online after I did say that I want to keep that channel alive for a bit I can't it, it's so hard to do do because I I've been promising you guys that I'm going to do the World Cup content on this channel and also the MLS on this channel and there's just no time for me to do a video on my second channel and hence that's why I don't put why I don't want to move my World Cup content in my second channel because nobody goes to that channel. But either way, going back to talk about this week and what has happened this week. Well, there was a lot of goals this week. And there was definitely a couple of big surprises. A couple of games that I definitely did not expect it to, that to happen. But what was so interesting about this week is that there was no sending off this week in all 11 games. And I think this is the first time that has happened this season where there's been no sending off throughout this entire match week. And knowing MLS and knowing how it is a league that is known for referee being kind of trigger happy by give, getting out his yellow car or a red car in the slightest contact that it is, it is very surprising that there was no sending off this week. Now, I'm not saying that there was none of the the thing that has happened this this weekend you know none of the games you would say that there's going to be no moment where you say that that there should have been a send off no there's definitely a couple of games that I thought there could have definitely been a sending off but it's just quite surprising that this weekend nobody got sent off in in all 11 games that is this week but either way let's begin this review and we start with the Friday action where FC Dallas won one nothing against Minnesota uh, rolling the mall with the only goal in this game in the 59th minute and let's just say that this was a very scrappy roll win for Dallas and I think they'll definitely be happy about that because Minnesota probably deserve a point in this you know they created so many opportunity in this game, but unfortunately nobody on that team could have finished those chances. And maybe this is also why they miss Miguel Ibarra so much on this team, because he's one of the guys that can put the ball into the back of the net. Um, but yeah, Minnesota very unlucky in this game, despite the fact that they, they were clearly the better team. Dallas had 
had barely any chances in this game. The bottom line is, Dallas was more clinical in this game, and with this win, they stay pace with Sporting KC potentially getting that top spot, and I think they also have made ground off of Sporting KC because, spoiler alert, they lost to Montreal, and I will get to that because that was one of those games that I said that I definitely did not expect it. But yeah, moving on to the next one, uh, the Cascadia Derby. Well, um, so I did watch the full 90 minutes of this Cascadia Derby, and let's just say that I wish I didn't watch the first half of this game. I mean, the first half was a sl snooze fest, pretty much. I mean, you you could have probably just skipped the first half and just watched the the second half, or if you if you just like look at the Cascadia Derby and you want to watch the DVR version, you might as well just watch the second half because one, all the goals happened in the second half, and two, there was absolutely nothing that happened in the first half. I mean, that first half was literally what what happened to the first Cascadia Derby this season where it was just so boring to watch. Like, there was no action whatsoever. Like, it was... Both teams just didn't want to attack whatsoever. It's almost as if both teams were playing in an MLS Cup Final where they just didn't want to take much risk whatsoever until the second half. And then, you know, the second half certainly made up for what could have been a, another boring Cascadia Derby um, with the Timbers scoring first, Maviella scoring in the 48th minute, and then the Sounders equalized with Victor Rodriguez. Then Timbers... Retake the lead, Armateros with the goal in the 57. Uh, Chad Marshall then equalized for the Sounders again thanks to a header. And then Mabiella got his brace in the 74th minute. And it turns out that was the winning goal of this Cascadia Derby. And certainly Mabiella, that is certainly a name that you wouldn't think that would be the guy that will save the Timbers and give the Timbers a victory over the Sounders in a Cascadia Derby. I mean, you know, not only he is a defender of the Timbers, but it's that he doesn't score a lot of goals. And yet he scored a brace in this game. Um, and, you know, all if, if you would have told me that if the Timbers would have beat the Sounders in this kind of scoreline, you, I, you would have, I would have said that at least maybe... Or you would have said that at least Valeri would be in the score sheet. Or even maybe Sebastian Blanco would be on the score sheet. But no, instead, it's Mabiella, the, the unlikeliest guy to able to carry the Timbers with a victory. Um, and as for the Sounders, well, I think maybe the, the one positive thing you can take away from this is that you score two goals. I mean, you score two goals in this game, which is certainly a... Seasonal best, I guess, because, you know, the Sounders, they only score 11 goals so far in MLS, which is by far the lowest of any other team in MLS. But, unfortunately, the bad news is you can see three goals. And despite the fact that you did show some passion to fight back twice from going down, you just give up a a goal in the 74th minute to a... A defender that doesn't score a lot and that is the reason why the Sounders are really bad this season and why the fans are clearly not happy about this team and it's pretty clear that the Sounders really need to think about start rebuilding which I think they're gonna do they're going to start this rebuilding process right around the second half of the season uh, which means that there is gonna be no miraculous kind of second half season to get the Sounders into the playoffs I mean if that happens I would be very, very surprised. But this team looked like... This is a team that just looked completely lost. And despite the fact that, yes, they do have injuries in their team. And even when they get those guys back, I don't think they're going to make any big impact. Because they are just... They're so far behind the teams that is currently above the red line. And by the time they get all those guys back, it's just a little bit too late. So... You might as well just kind of tear it down. You know, it's been a good run for the Sounders for the last 10 years, ever since they started in MLS. Uh, but I think this is really the first time I think the Sounders have to consider to rebuild. And just hopefully with this rebuilding process, they can get themselves back to the top. But yeah, um, next up. So the one-way derby ended as you kind of expected. 
with Atlanta with a one one sided win against Orlando City. Um, they win four nothing against them and goals in this game. Martinez with a goal in the third minute. Uh, lovely kind of cross from Julian Gritz. So to set up Martinez to score this first goal. I mean, that's not the first time that has happened in this season. Um, Amiron with the brace in this game. Barco also got on the score sheet. And yeah, no surprise in this game. You know, Atlanta, they're doing what they do at home throughout this whole season. And that is win and just playing this, this free-flowing football. I mean, I know that in the last couple of games, they haven't really quite done much of that. You know, they have kind of started to show a little bit of vulnerability and kind of show that they are back down to earth a little bit are not just just kind of like blowing out teams like crazy at home but in this game it was the complete different to what they have done in the last couple of weeks they absolutely dominate Orlando City and it kind of it's pretty obvious that they dominate them because Orlando City is a team that is just a sinking ship right now although they did just announce that they hire James O'Connor to become their new manager for them and for those of you that don't know who James O'Connor is he is used to be the manager for Louisville City who won the USL title last year and it looks like Orlando is trying to do the same thing that Portland did where you know how Portland hired Giovanni Savarisi and how Savarisi used to manage the Cosmo which was a second tier team well Orlando will hope that you know with what Savarisi has done for Portland so far this season has been pretty good. Orlando's hoping that that will be the same case by them hiring a USL manager that is James O'Connor and hopefully he can bring Orlando back into the playoff picture because right now Orlando City, if they don't turn this thing around, then this, this would be considered a waste of a season and it would be a big waste of the season because this is supposed to be an all-in year. I mean, I think they still have maybe one year left in this all-in year because I know that a couple of guys are tying in to another year in their contract, but really this this was a wasted kind of year because this is a year that they should be contending. And I'm not saying that they're they're completely done yet because as I'm going to be be talking about in the next game I feel like right now the Eastern Conference is just so wide open like I always talk about the Western Conference as a conference that you know if you're a bad team out there all you need is maybe a couple of games of winning streak and you're back in it but it's the same case now with the Eastern Conference as a, and as much as people say the Eastern Conference is tough and stuff like that you know you look at the standings and you look at fifth to 10th place in the Eastern Conference and it's not a big gap between those teams so it is just wide open in terms of teams that is currently below the red line in the Eastern Conference to sneak into the playoffs and you know Orlando City if they can finally figure stuff out and stop this bleeding which I think it's now at seven games or eight games something like that I mean I'm losing track of them because they they just lose every single week uh, but if they stop this bleeding and if their new manager James O'Connor can finally stabilize the ship and start winning a game then I expect Orlando City to get back up there above the red line which of course now brings me to talk about Montreal who yeah they won again and they beat Sporting KC this Sporting KC team this is the team that they beat that is currently top of the West, and this is a team that has been consistent throughout majority part of the year and have shown no mercy to teams that is in the lower lower part of the table. And yet, Montreal literally beat them in this game, and it wasn't even close of how this game is. I mean, this was kind of like similar to what the impact did to Orlando City a week ago, but only this time they did it at home, and they did it to a much inferior opponent. I mean, Sporting KC basically just, I don't know what in the world happened to them in this game. Like, it almost felt like they never left Kansas City and just literally decided to stay home and not show up in this game because 
Montreal absolutely blitzed them in this game. And if it wasn't for Tim Melia, who I think he is probably the only person that actually left Kansas City for this game against the Impact, this would have been 4 or 5 nothing. This would have been one of the biggest upset and one of the most surprising resort in MLS. And, you know, Montreal obviously goes from Piatti because it seemed like right now, whenever Montreal get a goal or get a win, Piatti will always get into that conversation, which I'm kind of surprised that Piatti is not going to be going to the All-Star game this season because he has been single-handedly keeping this Montreal team at least some sort of relevancy. I mean, if this Impact team does not have Piatti, <laughs> they will be like DC United right now, which is like right near the bottom of the table. Um, Silva, of course, score a penalty in this game also. And like I said, this is this was certainly not what I expected. And Montreal now have won three in a row. And as I said a couple of minutes ago of how if you're a team that if you get into a good winning streak maybe like a three or four game winning streak, then you could easily get yourself back into the playoff conversation. And right now, Montreal is only two points below the red line. And this is a team that I said a couple of weeks ago were done. Like, they they were just completely done. They were on a, on a bad losing streak. Their team is just... There is just nobody on that team that can actually, actually score or defend or be creative on the attack it, it's just I thought Montreal was done and it was just doom and gloom for them but now all of a sudden three straight wins and now they are are well truly alive in the playoff conversation um, but you know whether or not if that continue whether or not if this is just one of those days where the impact finally hit the hit all hit on all cylinder in this game and that maybe in the next game they just disappoint impacts fan again by losing we'll see how it goes and for sporting kc well i hope this is just a one-off because that was probably the worst performance i've seen sporting kc play throughout the whole year and it, it it's not even close like to lose to montreal and to to get dominated like that 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 is just i, I i'm i'm kind of left speechless of how that that's just happened. But one game that I definitely did not leave speechless and one game that I kind of expected it to happen is Columbus, which I expect them to win, and they did. They beat against RSL. And I feel like right now, if you're a team that is suffering from a long losing streak or you're in a very bad run right now, you know, RSL will basically be your treatment. RSL will basically be kind of like the, the doctor that... You need it because they are just kind of like giving points for free. Like Columbus coming into this game, they were on a four-game winless skit. And, you know, they come into the, this game certainly with not a lot of confidence. But they're playing against RSL who themselves have not done anything on the road. Besides beating the Sounders. But we know the Sounders are bad this season. And guess what happened in this game? They lost to Columbus in this game, um, Zardes and Sosa with an absolute wonderful strike. That is, and this definitely could be one of the goals that will be nominated for goal of the week. Uh, Albert Rusnak did get one back to RSL, but it's another loss for RSL on the road. And I think for the rest of the season, if you're an RSL fan, you might as well just watch the home games and just do not watch the road game you know as a quakes fan i actually had that kind of feeling last year when i was like i never mentioned this but last year i kind of had a feeling where i might as well just not watch the road games because i know we're gonna get blown out every single game and just watch the home games because we always win win and we always have some positive to cheer about uh but you know i ultimately did not did that because then that is not what a true kind of passionate and kind of kind of committed fan that I am to the Quakes. Uh, and, you know, for RSL, you know, you could try to do that. Maybe that will be one way that you, you guys can get into the playoffs. I mean, for RSL, despite the fact that they've been losing a lot on the road, at least they've 
doing well at home. And you know, if you're a team that if you're winning every home games and maybe in on the road you might sneak like one or two wins, you can still get into the playoffs because it is what it is. And that's how my Quakes team got sneaked into the playoff last season. I mean, to be fair, we kind of did rely a little bit of luck last season. Um, and the fact that, that we had to really rely on a couple of teams to try to you know, trying to push ourselves into the playoffs and that nobody last season in the Western Conference really want to go into the playoffs. But, you know, for RSL, maybe you can just keep winning at home and lose on the road and maybe somehow you will find yourself in the sixth or fifth seed because, you know, the Western Conference, it's a conference that is weak and it's a conference that all you need is just a good run and you're just in it. Kind of like similar to what the Eastern Conference is. But I think the other thing that I really think RSL really need this summer is that they need a striker. Like, it's pretty clear that this team does not have a true number nine. I mean, you know, so far this season, they have had a couple of guys on this team that act as a striker, I would say, that score goals. You know, guys like Luis Silva and Corey Bear act as kind of like a striker and scoring goals. But they're not really like a number nine that you would really want to rely on as a guy that can score you goals. And I just think that if they can get a new striker and it, and if they can get that young core of their midfield kind of like, like fix a little bit because this season that young talented midfield has been anything but good. They have looked nothing like they were last season. And maybe if RSL can get a couple of guys back in the squad then I think this team will definitely be one of the team to watch um, and for Columbus you know hopefully maybe this is a victory where it spark another long winning streak because that's what the crew season it's been it's been like when they are winning they definitely are winning but when they are losing yeah they're definitely losing so maybe this is another long winning streak or long unbeaten streak that the crew are in and I'm pretty sure the crew fan will be happy if that is the case. But yeah, moving on to the next game. So the Revs won 3-2 against DC United. Uh, Panea with another two goals. I mean, you know, Christian Panea, he is just, he's probably one of the, the most surprising kind of talented guy in this team alongside with Bunbury who score again and that is his 10th goal which it is now his career high in a season which you know he has hit his career high in a season and we're not even well we're just past the halfway part of the season which just tells you how good of a season that Teal Bunbury has and who would have thought that he would be a goal scoring machine for the Revs this season but you know DC United certainly would feel like they should have deserved a draw in this game and in some way they felt like they got robbed in this game because there was a bit of a controversy with the penalty that Panea did put away and the winning goal and that was the fact that was there actually was there actually like kind of contact in the box and what happened in this play was basically I think it was Fisher and Farrell was battling for the ball and what happened was I think it was Fisher the one that just kind of like pulled down Farrell and then Farrell basically kind of like land on top of him on something like that and the ref basically calls a penalty on that now on the play it looked like Fisher definitely fouled Farrell there but it looked like Farrell was the one that basically pushed him push Fisher down and that basically is how how the Revs got a penalty. And I, I understand why DC United fans are upset about that. Because, you know, they they would think that it was Fisher. Or not Fisher, but the F Pharaoh, the one that actually fouled Fisher before Fisher actually kind of like dive and kind of cut down Pharaoh on that, that play. But, you know, unfortunately, I... I would say that that's kind of like a 50-50 kind of 
kind of call. You know, if the referee didn't spot the original foul, then yeah, that's definitely a penalty. And it's unfortunate that the referee didn't spot that original foul. Now, if they did spot that original foul, then it wouldn't be a penalty, which that's why I say that it's kind of like a 50-50 call. But, you know, for the refs, it's another win. It's certainly a hard-fought win. But now they do have a very kind of top part tough part of their schedule where they're going to be going on the road for a bit and that's something the refs have not done very well so far this season and DC United well at least Wayne Rooney is coming to your club and that you know you could definitely be looking forward to to that and maybe Wayne Rooney might be be able to carry your team to get into the playoffs because like I said it doesn't take a lot for a team in the Eastern Conference to get into the playoffs although DC United is a little bit far away from the the red line. I mean, they're definitely much farther apart above the uh, above the red line than any team that is currently from 10th to 5th place right now. But yeah, next up, uh, Chicago with a surprising win against NYCFC. Uh, they beat them 3-2, and this was also the other surprising resort. Uh, goals in this game, Nikolic. With another goal for the fire. And Alexander Katai with a brace in this game. And also the winning goal in this game. And this guy right now, he cannot stop scoring. Like Alexander Katai all of a sudden in these last couple of games has become a goal scoring machine. And with him doing this, th we have to go back to the conversation that we had in the beginning of the season. When the fire... So a calm and brought in Katai and how we kind of talked about how this was a huge loss to the Chicago Fire because a calm was the heart and soul of this team and that I didn't think Katai when he come in and act as potentially a replacement for a calm I didn't think that he was going to do that I mean at that time he was kind of like you know he definitely had a bit of talent in up his sleeve but he is nothing like a calm well fast forward 17 weeks later he is literally acting like what a calm did to the Chicago Fire last season and that is scoring goals for fun and that is helping out this team and contribute in key moments and you know Chicago right now they are on a five game unbeaten streak and as much as I'm making fun of Chicago every single week about how they are not going to, they're not going to kick out of this inconsistent form that they've been in throughout the season, all of a sudden they have started to find that consistent form. And that they have started to kick out of that inconsistent form. And that right now, if they can keep this up, they could definitely be moving up high up in the table. And that this team can definitely get into the playoffs. And, you know, for NYCFC, which, by the way, the, the two goals that they score was Tajiri Shradi, who scored another goal in this game. That brings his total to eight. Uh, I don't think he's actually on the All-Star team, which I'm very surprised because Tajiri Shradi, he is one of those guys that are probably one well, of the biggest supplies, surprise this season. I mean, who would have thought that he would be kind of like a goal-scoring machine that he is. I mean, we well, in some way, we knew that he can make a big impact when he come off the bench, but even when he's now starting for most of the game for NYCFC, he has looked just as deadly as he is when he came off the bench, and now he, all of a sudden, he just become a goal-scoring machine in this season with eight goals, and the other guy that have also started to become a a little bit of a goal scoring machine and just cannot stop scoring goals is Birgit who is now score scored three goals in the last two games and despite the fact that Birgit you know he hasn't had the best time so far with NYCFC and that he is clearly nothing like what David Villa is for this NYCFC team at least he's now contribute in these last couple of games but unfortunately unlike the last game where he did score those two crucial goals to beat TFC in this game the goal that he scored only got the equalizer and it turns out that well actually that it gave them the lead but eventually they just flew it threw it away because Katai decided to show up and score those two goals in the second half 
And for NYCFC, this is definitely not a good loss because they lose ground to Atlanta in the Supporters' Shield standings. And I think that's one of the biggest priority that NYCFC is aiming for. I mean, besides the fact that they want to do well when they get into the playoffs, they also want to win some silverware. And the, the silverware that most likely they, they could win this season might be the supporter shield because they're fighting Atlanta for it. And, but unfortunately, like I said, they lost ground in this game because Atlanta won this week. But yeah, next up, LAFC. They won again, and this time they beat Philadelphia 4-1. Dio Monday with a hat trick in this game. Uh, the other goals was blessing in the 96th minute. Uh, the only goal for the Union was Peacock, but Dio Monday scoring a hat trick in this game. And right now, I think I have finally found out why exactly LAFC is continue to win despite the fact that they don't have Vela or Orania. And that answer is him, Dio Monday. He has been an absolute goal-scoring machine in these last couple of games. And he is just right now approaching record pace in terms of scoring goals. Like, right now he has scored seven goals this season. And he has only made like 300-so minute appearance. I mean, that is like, what, 40, 40 minute per goal that he, he has scored in terms of the goal and minute ratio. It is just absolutely incredible of how, what he is doing for this LAFC team. And how, you got to also remember, he did not become a member of LAFC until after a couple week of the season when LAFC finally signed him. And LAFC didn't think that he was going to be a major kind of impact. He was going to be a player that at least he's going to be kind of half decent to what uh, Vela is and what Orania is. But instead... It seemed like they're getting even more than what they expected. Maybe even 300% more than what they expect Diamandi is. Because he is just an absolute beast right now. And that now, this kind of creates a little bit of a problem for Bob Bradley. And it's probably a good problem to have. Because now, what do you do when Orania and Vela is back? Um, you know, I know for sure that Bob Bradley will not have Diamande, Vela, Rossi, and Aurelia in the same lineup because they're going to have to put eventually one of, the, one of the guys out of position, and I don't think that's what Bob Bradley would want it to do. Um, I think the biggest decision that Bart Bradley has to make right now is that, you know, do you leave Diamande in the starting 11 and just kind of like put Aurelia on the bench and that maybe Aurelia can come off the bench to make a big impact or do you do the other way around or do you bench Diego Rossi well I wouldn't say bench but just put him on the bench and make him as a sub and Diamandi will be up front there with with Orania it would be very interesting to see what Bradley will do once Orania and Vela gets back because like I said they can't just have three striker up front and expect that to work and you know like I said about Diamande he is just what he is doing is just absolutely incredible and something that I'm pretty sure a lot of people are not expecting I'm pretty sure a lot of LAFC fans are not expecting of what Diamande is doing for this team because he has just been an absolute goal scoring threat just came out of nowhere almost and as for the Union, well, welcome back to reality. You know, for Philly, they had a good good kind of win against Vancouver. But guess what? When you go on the road and you're playing one of the best teams in the West, that can, of course, happen. And, yeah, they got absolutely dominated in that game. But, yeah, talk about the last three games of this match week. So, just a little bit, a bit quickly talking about the Cali Classico because I've already done the vlog and I can sense that there is going to be a couple people in the comments that is going to say that this is what you get for calling Ibra a self egoistic kind of proclaimed god and that this is what you, what you get for trying to trash talk Zlatan and that whenever you trash talk Zlatan Zlatan will always find a way to shut you up because I know it those comments are definitely coming and I I'm bracing 
myself for it, but I wouldn't care because you know what? Yes, he, Zlatan scored two goals against us, and technically he should have scored one goal in this game because guess what? The second goal that he he scored, Tarbell once again should have got damn saved that free kick. Like seriously, how in the world did Tarbell not save that free kick? Like I know Zlatan basically hit it low and under the wall, but seriously, even though. Tarbell kind of have to react late to that because of that ball going under the wall. It was not hit very powerfully. Like any other goalkeeper, any other decent kind of above mediocre goalkeeper would have easily palmed that one away. But instead, Tarbell doesn't do that. And at that point, we went down 3-1 in the game. Uh, the good thing is the team actually showed some fight and passion um, and for once, we actually decided to to like try to salvage something in this game, and we did eventually. Vako scoring a goal, and that was certainly a big goal for us because at that point, you know, you just the the moment after the Galaxy scored that third goal, Stanford Stadium was just so so dead. Like it was, it was just such a quiet crap crowd because of the fact that the team was down 3-1. There was just no energy whatsoever. I mean, besides maybe the ultras that, that keep singing and also the Galaxy fans just going completely nuts and going through their, their chant to to continue supporting the team. It was just dead quiet after that third goal was scored. Uh, but eventually, like I said, Vako did gave, gave us a lifeline and then eventually in the second half, you know, we did score another penalty by the way both of these goals that Wando scored was a penalty the first one he missed it but fortunately for us Bingham basically pushed that one right back into Wando's those feet and Wando basically just slotted home to score that goal and I'm not sure you guys saw that after Wando scored that goal he literally decided to just kind of like he was shouting at Bingham he was like Almost like making fun of Bingham, kind of like insulting him while Bingham just kind of like hold his head down in shame. And that, wow, that was certainly a very interesting moment. And I'm pretty sure that maybe that is a moment where it just shows you, showed that Wando is just reminding Bingham of why he left and what why he is just a toxic kind of personality to the Quakes locker room. And that it is the reason why the Quakes will never welcome him back to this team and that they will they will always have all the hatred toward Bingham because, yeah, because of what happened last year. But, you know, it's a good thing that we did kind of fought back in this game and did show some passion. I mean, we, in some way, after we got that equalizer and make, tie the game at three, you know, there was definitely chances for us to get the winner. You know, Wando uh, could have got that winner right before stoppage time but he hit the post and then we could have easily lost this game because Jameson had a a chance to basically put the ball into the back of the net after a lovely cross I think it was Allison Drini that delivered that cross into Jameson and I thought for sure that Jameson was gonna hit that one into the back of the net but instead he hit it why that was just so, like my heart literally was about to break again like I was about to suffer the same feeling that we had in that game against LAFC, but fortunately it went wide, and in the end it it finished honors even. And like I said about the the New England game, you know I'm I'm not going to say that I I'm very happy about this resort, but at the same time I'm not going to be upset about it, and that I'm going to just I'm going to enjoy this game because you know it was an entertaining game and that we at least fought back and show some passion. I mean, at the end of the day, all I want for the Quakes throughout these remaining part of the season is that not only they need to finally start getting a win, but also show some passion. Show that you actually still care about this team. And, you know, throughout the season, you have seen me talk about how this team just... They just don't feel like... The players on this team just don't feel like they care about this team anymore and are not playing for the shirt and really in that game it felt like for once they actually showed that passion and felt like they were playing for the shirt and that they were trying to to get 
a winner and try to have some good things and have something that all of us Quakes fans can cheer about. But unfortunately, I wouldn't say we had a lot to cheer about because you know we didn't get this victory and it is another game that we are now winless. And hopefully, eventually, when we do play, uh, I know heading into July, we do have, I wouldn't say an easy stretch, but we do face against Montreal, who is getting hot again, and we're playing against RSL and the Sounders, and those are probably the games that we potentially can get a win, because like I said about RSL earlier, they're a team that if you have a long winless streak, then why not play us, because we're just going to hand you free points like a, a bag of gift, and the Sounders, you know, it's the same thing, they cannot win whatsoever so maybe those are the game that finally ends our winless run but yeah moving on to the last two game and i'm not gonna mention these last two game very long i'm not gonna go too much in detail because i know this is already a long video uh tfc of course lose another game this time they lose to the red bulls um only goal in this game was kamar lauren scoring which you know alex bono how in the world did you not save that that was just like, when Kamar Lauren strikes that ball, uh, Bono sh looked like he was about to smother that one, but instead he he basically let that one trickle his hand and it end up into the back of the net. And in some way, that was a big kind of goalkeeping howler for Bono. And TFC, of course, despite conceding the goal early, they pretty much just dominate the game. After that, and the Red Bulls, you know, it was really, they they can pretty much thank Luis Robles after this victory that they had against CFC because if it wasn't for Robles saving some big kind of save, including a penalty that he saved, which, by the way, I still don't get why Javinko is still taking penalties for TFC. And I'm pretty sure that is a question that a lot of TFC fan is asking because he is two of his last seven penalty attempt. I mean, that is just... Like, if that doesn't sh show you that you clearly need another penalty kick taker because the one that you currently have is currently struggling, then I don't know what is. Like, why in the world do you keep putting Javinko there? Like, surely there has to be another player on that team that can, can step up to take a penalty and basically put it into the back of the net on that penalty besides Javanko right now who is clearly struggling taking penalties but certainly that was a big save by Robles and Robles did made a couple of big save too in this game and yeah it's a good victory for the Red Bulls not a pretty victory but it is a good victory for them and for TFC well the season that you didn't think that couldn't get any worse it just got worse because you dominate the whole game, but unfortunately, you weren't clinical whatsoever, and because of that, you lose this one. It's just that simple. But finally, the final game to talk about, Colorado, two-game winning streak. And I'm pretty sure the Rapids fan are going absolutely nuts right now, because who would have thought that after a nine-game losing streak, and after going ten winless, that they can have two game with a win after that? And Vancouver, you know, this is the same case, I would say, about TFC and the Red Bulls. Um, and I can say the same thing about Vancouver and and Colorado, is that Vancouver pretty much just dominate the, the entire part of this game. But unfortunately, they weren't very clinical whatsoever, and that is the reason why they lost this one. And this own goal that uh, Marcel De, De Young score was kind of, a little bit strange and hilarious because the ball was actually bounced off the post and then I think it was Joe Mason that literally had a a five yard sitter for him to put it into the back of the net and he just missed it and then then when when Brian Rose saved that shot unfortunately it hit off of DeYoung and it basically trickled into the back of the net I mean that is just that is just very unfortunate for the Whitecaps Apparently, pretty much one of the most ugliest goal that you will see to s score but Colorado fans won't care and the Rapids certainly won't care if that went in because that turns out to be the winning goal and that turns out to be a goal that give them this two game winning streak 
And now maybe you could say that Colorado can go on a bit of a streak and maybe get themselves back into the playoff contention. Oh man, I, I think that's a little bit kind of overstatement and a little bit of a deluded statement. But hey, you never know. I mean, Montreal, I said it before of how they been in kind of a doom and gloom situation and now they have three wins in a row. You know, maybe Colorado can do the same thing. But I don't know. We'll, we'll, time, of course, will tell if Colorado can continue this same, this this form right now. But as for Vancouver, yeah, that was a bad loss. And Vancouver, their hopes of making the playoffs is started to dwindle game after game after game. But yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you do, make sure you guys leave a like, smash that subscribe button. Uh, I don't even know if I wanted to do the preview of the the six games that's going to happen in the midweek because I am actually exhausted right now. But either way, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you do, make sure you guys leave a like, smash that subscribe button. And yeah, I will see you guys next time.